You know, if they could get away with it, they probably would have taken bets on whether or not I was going to have my mic ready and everything ready to go this morning. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Everybody enjoying the free air conditioning? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I bet we've had our windows open. Is that better? <laughs> I've got down in the bag. It's like, no, no. But uh, for those of you that are watching online, we do have like to have a little bit of fun, so that in, kind of explains what just happened here. But um, this week, we'd love to have you join us on Wednesday night as we continue uh, the Bible mini series, uh, showing the next uh, episode in that. I can't believe we're halfway through it already. Um, little teaser as soon as this one's over there's no slide for this just a little teaser after this one's over we start the chosen season four so keep your eyes open for that announcement um and then we can take a little break before we have another real big activity and then on uh saturday september 7th let's start another we like to have our busy weeks up front get them out of the way so uh, on September 7th, we'll have our men's breakfast at 9 a.m. I understand that uh, Trey and Doug are in charge of uh, some menu items, um, whether they've been voluntold. So. <laughs> always good. So, yeah, well, we always have good food. There's never a problem with that. So join us for great food, fellowship, and a devotion. And then this one got snuck in. Um, we... Uh, had decided on the movie, we hadn't decided on the date, we did decide on the date uh, this morning, so we like to do things like that. But September 7th at 6 o'clock, uh, we'll be showing the movie Evan Almighty. Now, disclaimer, this is not a theologically correct movie. And it, I know some folks uh, like, yeah, no, God said you'd never flood the earth again. Well, the thing that, about these types of movies that Mark and I like to do is we like the fact that they give us an opportunity to have spiritual conversations. It's kind of like when we showed The Shack last year. It gave us an opportunity to have spiritual conversations. So that's what this does. Um, and it is a, a fairly tame movie, um, but it has some good... Uh, imagery in it and it also again allows to have some conversation so uh, and it might bring in some folks that may not normally come to a church for a movie and that's another goal is yeah. to get people to come in and so we can have those conversations mm -hmm. then we'll get done with men's breakfast and we'll get done with the movie night and then we'll, next week we'll come back and we'll have the track all set up and we will be having our September races um, we announced on uh, the races yesterday that we would be updating and upgrading the track after the first year for season 20 and I started to roll the shorter piece down and uh, it fell off the track and it's like all I could think of was something that we say when cars don't make it all the way down and they fall off the track we just yell jumper so I yelled jumper and everybody laughed so it, kind of an off the cuff thing, but we got it all the way rolled out and we showed them what it was going to look like at least at the top and talked to them about it. And certainly we want to thank our partners at Blue Track Racing or BlueTrack.com uh, who have helped us in getting to this point where we can go ahead and get that track updated. So uh, then finally, um, if you're watching online, uh, you'll notice the link didn't change from this week to last week for the music because we have a button on our website where you can click and go and view the worship music for each Sunday. And so if you go out to GraceStreet.Church and click on Messages right in the top in the center, it says Worship Music for August 11th. So go out there and click on that after uh, the message today and you'll be able to worship with the same music that we are in, here inside. So. With that, let's open up with a word of prayer. Father God, we thank you. You have given us a break from the heat. You have given us beautiful weather. You've given us rain that we need 
uh, to keep the trees and the grass green, the flowers blooming, and we just thank you for that. And Father, as we come together today, we ask that you would center us this morning. So oftentimes we hear people say that, wow, I believe I don't need to go to church. That's just a, that's just a, a legalistic thing to do. And the truth is, is what it says in the Proverbs, and it says iron sharpens iron, and unless we come together, we can't be sharpened, we can't grow, and that's why we need to come together each week, whether that's on Sundays or Wednesdays, at uh, maybe a separate get-together, the movie nights, the racing, whatever it is, Lord. And we just thank you that you have given us this opportunity, this place to do that. As we prepare to hear your word this morning, Father, open our hearts, open our minds, and ultimately let it open our eyes to what you would have us do in each and every day. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So this morning's call to worship comes... Video ended. Video ended. We have a technical difficulty. Your broadcast has ended. And we're back. Just to mess the people back in the tech booth up. So our call to worship this morning comes from Micah, chapter 5, verse 2. And it says, But you, Bethlehem of Athra, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel whose goings forth are from of old, from everlasting. Micah is prophesying at a time where the Jewish leaders are obsessed with wealth, with power, and position. Kind of sounds familiar. It's been an ongoing thing since before then and after then until the present. And in verse 1, the verse just before this, Micah has prophesied the destruction of Jerusalem. But this prophecy, this verse provides us a new hope. And it, initially it was for Israel, but now it's, it's for the world. And it's a new hope of a new king. It would be hundreds of years later that God fulfills this prophecy <coughs> And he does it by causing the Romans to take a census. And in that census, Joseph takes his bride, or his soon-to-be bride, Mary, to his ancestral home of Bethlehem. There, Mary gives birth to the one who would one day rule the world. This is no ordinary king. You all know that. His origin is from ancient times, which we know is from eternity, as it says in this verse, from everlasting. Conceived by the Holy Spirit in the womb of a virgin, this king is the Son of God. And the prophecy in Micah 5 is that the next king in the line of David would be the Messiah. This prophecy will take the Israelites from their great dis uh, present distress that they were in to the Messiah's birth, although they had to wait. We don't like to wait, do we? There's a line in the movie that we're going to be watching where uh, Evan's wife 
is talking to the waiter who, in, as we'll find out, is God. And she says, why doesn't God give me patience? And Morgan Freeman's character says, do you ever think God's just giving you an opportunity to be patient? Do we have to remember to be patient? Because um, in God's timing, it's perfect. But it would take them from that distress to the Messiah's birth and ultimately his victory. And then it will take them from birth to revolution. Father, we just thank you for the message that you have given to Mark this morning. We thank you that from this learning, we will have a better understanding of our relationship with you. And we will better understand why you sent your son and what the end goal was. Father, it breaks my heart when people don't want to hear this message. When they flat out say, I'm not interested. Father, we can't keep this message hidden. And as we hear this message from birth to revolution, let it give us guidance and how we can have those conversations. In Jesus' name, amen. It's always fun sitting in the back where you guys can't see what we're doing. So we've been back there scrambling, trying to get the video back up and running and everything <laughs> back there. So we're having technical difficulties. Um, I'm fighting a migraine today, so if I kind of stumble on some words, just bear with me. So uh, I'm having technical difficulties too. <laughs> so this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. So today I want to talk to you about a uh, journey from birth to revolution. And this really takes us from the, the journey of Jesus from prophecy to Messiah. And then the whole thing of Jesus coming to us here was to start a revolution, to break the change that the people were in from before and to give us a new beginning, a new start, a new relationship with God. Oh, wow, this is going to be great. <laughs> uh, bear with me. <laughs> Hard to read when you get tears in your eyes. But. But anyway, as we start back here, the story actually starts 700 years before Jesus was born. And the prophet Isaiah foretold the birth of Jesus coming in his message in Isaiah 7, uh, 14. He said, Hear now, O house of David, it is a small thing for you to weary men, but will you weary my God also? Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and, and shall call his name Emmanuel. Curds and honey he shall eat, that he may know to refuse the evil and choose the good. And in Micah 5, 2, it goes on in another, another prophecy. God was speaking to the people even though they strayed away. He was speaking to the people and he says, But you, O Bethlehem Ephrathah, Though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one ruler in Israel. Notice these words. Be very, very careful and read these, read these very, very carefully. Wow, great disconnect. Sorry. But he is saying in here, he says, the one ruler in Israel who's goings forth are from old, from everlasting. Meaning that Jesus was there from the very start. He was there in the, God, in the garden when God was building everything. He was there from the start. So he was from old all the way back to everlasting. He will be with us to eternity. And so here the prophets established them. A really big change is coming. And it's ordained by God and directed to the Jewish people who were his chosen among the nations. From the very beginning, from the very beginning, and when we take a look at this, from the very old, this is what it means in the Old Testament, 
when they say from old, from the very beginning, from the garden on out, people have rebelled against God in one form or another. Yet in spite of the rebellion, in spite of them straying away, God remained faithful to them the whole time. The Old Testament then is a journey of his chosen people and how God pursued them even though they strayed away. So if we look at it over and over and over again in the Old Testament, it tells us about how, how far the, uh, the Jewish people were straying away from God. They were rebelling against him and everything. But see, his love never changed. He pursued them anyway because they were his chosen people. So most of us know these stories and how they played out, and it wasn't really all that well for the Jewish people. <laughs> uh, we were talking about that flood that we're going to watch coming up. That didn't play out well for the people in there. God said, hey, enough's enough, and we had a flood. Now he promised he wouldn't flood ever again, but what's coming is he's going to bring fire instead. So. So today, I want to look at things a little bit differently. I want you to kind of change your perspective as we go through this today. And we're going to explore some of the topics of Jesus' early years when he began his ministry. And the journey begins long before God sent Jesus into the world. As we saw here in Isaiah and Micah, that was, that was 700 years and 500 years before Jesus was born. The plan was all laid out ahead of time. God is everlasting to everlasting, and a thousand years to him is a minute. So, you know, for us, you know, it's a heck of a long time that happened. For God, it's a blink of an eye. I didn't know good blink, as the Germans say. The journey begins then long before God sent Jesus into the world, so we will wind back the hands of time a little bit here and take a look at some of these points that we need to ponder. So when God sent Moses to free the Jews from slavery in Egypt, he gave them some rules to go by in order to live as a godly people. Now, we know those as the Ten Commandments. So, problem is, from a Western perspective, and, and kind of from our humanness, we look at those as uh, negative. But what it was, was it, they were rules on established on how to live in communion with each other, as a community with God, as a godly people. And that's what these were. So those Ten Commandments, uh, we, we tend to look at them in the negative, meaning thou shalt not this, thou shalt not that, and we look at it as restraining us in our behavior. But really what it is, is just the opposite. It is how to live as a godly people and remain in the favor of God. Here's how to have a right relationship with each other as a community and a right relationship with God at the same time. That's what the Ten Commandments are all about. It isn't saying, hey, I, I don't want you to have a good, fulfilled life. He says, I want you to have a good, fulfilled relationship with each other as godly people, as the people of God, and I want you to have a right relationship with me as your God. Ever think about it that way? Ever look at the Ten Commandments that way? I know as a kid I sure didn't. Mm -hmm. You know, here's God in heaven. It's like my dad, you know, okay, you will not do this, you will not do that. Of course, I, what I do, I was just like the Jewish people. I went out and did the opposite thing. Mm -hmm. So, of course, I never got in trouble. <laughs> Waiting for the lightning to come. Um, so as we look at this, um, we want to know and we want to look at these things as a guideline to a better life as well. Less issues, less problems, if we simply follow along. Pretty simple, right? Gives us the Ten Commandments through Moses. Simple thing to follow, right? Just ten. Just ten. Not a big deal. But see, it's very difficult due to human nature. It's important to note then, as we look at these things, we have issues comprehending the meaning of some of the writings in the Bible due to the context in which it was written. And so as the Bible is written, all the different books of the Bible are written for different contexts, for different peoples, for what they were going through, the different cultures that they were going through. And we tend to look at that through a Western lens. But Eastern culture is completely different from Western culture. And the culture back then 
is completely different from the culture today. I mean, you've got to agree with that. Mm -hmm. uh, so let's review a couple of those fundamental truths. Jesus was Jewish, right? Mm -hmm. He was Jewish. The first disciples were Jewish. The prophets who said he was coming for centuries were Jewish. The early churches made up of the first Christians were Jewish. The people who condemned Jesus to death were Jews. The Romans carried out a sentence that was passed down by the Jews, but the people who condemned Jesus to death were Jews, his own people. The main opponent of Jesus at the time, back in those days, were Jewish. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, King Herod the Great himself, King of Judea, King of the Jews was his title back in those days. And he was a Jew who was serving Roman interests. So when we take a look at this, we have to understand that that is all written for a specific community. And we have to look at it from that perspective, from a Jewish perspective. By the way, you didn't want to be son of the great Herod the Great because he killed three of his sons, three out of his four, because of his paranoia. He was afraid somebody was going to take over his king. He was going to replace him. But we won't jump ahead to that right now. But Christianity is rooted in Judaism. Many people don't recognize this. And if you're like most people, you might say that Jesus was a Christian and the early church was started by Christians. But see, that's just simply not the case. What's missing from that statement is, and what removes the Jewishness from Jesus then, his disciples in the very beginning of the church, is thinking of it as a Christian story. But actually, it's a Jewish story. And if you change the lens that you're viewing things in in here, if you look at it from that perspective, then it kind of changes a lot of things when we go to interpret what is written then in the scriptures. And too often, the Christian faith is separated from its Jewish roots. Because if you look from the very beginning, the chosen people were always the Jews, right? God wanted to reconcile the the Gentiles with the Jewish community and with himself and end that separation. But again, I jumped ahead. So, understanding that we can't separate the Jewishness from the roots of the Bible and from the community that we're talking to in here, this can lead to a misunderstanding of the Bible and of Jesus himself and what God's mission was for Jesus when he brought him down to us. The stories written may not translate well because we're looking at them from our own understanding, from a Western cultural point of view. And our Western cultural point of view is not in con context with what was written in the Bible at the time. Jewish culture and Greek culture were the most prevalent during those times and in those regions that this is written and the writers are in at the time. So we have to kind of put our put our different lenses on and take a look at it from that perspective and then it becomes much more fully understandable for us um, and then we can translate that much better to what God was actually trying to do. So for the most part the key players were all Jews and they'd been living in foreign countries but their heritage was still Jewish, right? Most of the Bible was written for a particular people, a region, or an audience, some may have been Jews, some may have been Gentiles, but none of them were from Cedar Rapids, Iowa. <laughs> so we have to understand when we're doing this and we're reading this and we're studying this, we can't look at it from the Cedar Rapids, Iowa perspective. It won't work. So we need to have the correct perspective and understand what is written. So the birth of Jesus, so let's take a look at this then as we start, because I said we're going to start at the beginning and work our way forward, right? Well, Matthew 1, 18 through 25 says, Now, the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child of the Holy Spirit. Then Joseph, her husband, being just a man, and not wanting to make her a public example, because he was very much in love with her, was minded to put her away secretly. 
But while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary to be your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. So all of this was done so that it might be fulfilled what was spoken by the Lord through the prophets, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated to be God with us. Then Joseph, being aroused from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord commanded and took to him his wife and did not know her until she had brought forth her firstborn son. And he called his name Jesus. So stepping back to the beginning here, let's look at this closer. So from a Jewish perspective, this was a very, very, very bad thing. You have to understand. So if we take a, take a step back out of the Cedar Rapids culture, today's culture, today's perspective, today's norms, we have to step ourselves back into that Jewish time frame and in the Jewish culture. And looking at that then, in the Jewish community and culture at the time, this was a very, very bad thing. Had Joseph not stepped up and said he was going to marry, Mary, 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 who wrote this? I guess I did. Um, Mary could have been stoned, so it's Mary, Mary, Mary. If he didn't, if he didn't step up, Mary, 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 then could have been stoned. So it's three separate Marys, but one of them spelled differently. Mary could have been stoned to death, and that would have been the end of the story right there. Have you ever thought about that? See, this is Jewish custom. This is Jewish culture. We have to understand from their perspective. You know, he either could have put her away. Now the the do you know what that means? Doesn't mean dispatching her. No. It means that he would have taken her away and she would have been kept by herself out of the sight of the community. She would have been banished from the community in which she lived. She would give birth by herself, usually out in a cave or something like that. And so she would be completely segregated from the Jewish community, from her family, from her friends, from everything else. She would have been an outcast, or they could have stoned her to death, one of the two. He didn't want her to die, so he was thinking about taking her out there and having her give birth outside. Notice no Planned Parenthood in the picture, nothing like that, right? So what we have to do is we have to look at this from that perspective. But God knowing this, he knew what the, what the customs of the day were, what the rules were, so he sent Gabriel, his head angel, to Joseph to set things straight. So here also is the message of being delivered of the Christ, the Savior, being delivered to the Jewish people. This was the first deliverance, delivering Mary out of that cultural issue that she was facing by Joseph. He removed her from that. God sent the angels, said, hey, depart from the village, go and do this. And so... Mary was saved from being stunned to death. Most people kind of glaze over that. They don't understand the cultural inferences on the back end side. So from a Cedar Rapids side, what perspective? We see it differently. When we step into that Jewish lens and the Jewish culture lens, it speaks to us a lot differently in what was done. So this was a huge step by Joseph. You have to understand, this was a huge step by Joseph because... Because he hadn't slept with her. Normal people would think there's a massive betrayal that happened here. By stepping up and taking Mary then to be his wife, he also was segregating himself. He was taking that blame upon himself. And so he would be segregated as well. Cultural things, differences. So, look no further than the prophecies that are being fulfilled that were written by Isaiah and Micah at that point in time. This is being told so that there would be no doubt, no question unanswered of who he is and who God says he is. And he would be then the one and only Son of God. 
as it was proclaimed in the prophecies 700 years and 500 years ahead of his birth, God was saying, okay, this is who he is. That, I mean, can you imagine what happened with Joseph when the angel Gabriel came down? Now, the angels are said to be like 12 feet tall, huge, you know, you don't mess with them kind of guys, bouncers. Uh, so he sends Gabriel down to give this message to Joseph, and, and that's got to be intimidating in its own right. But for the Jews of the day, see, they should have been ecstatic here. Right in their midst now was their deliverer that was foretold of them a thousand years before, right? That God was going to send a deliverer. Well, here he was in their midst, but they didn't recognize him. They didn't recognize who he was. So finally, after hundreds and hundreds of years, the Savior had come at last. But not all were going to be happy about this. Remember, from a Jewish perspective then, this Savior would be a complete disruption to the Jewish way of life that was established through the Jewish elders, the chief priests, the scribes, the Sadducees, the Pharisees. This could signal then the end of their very way of life. And they made a very cushy, extravagant lifestyle at the cost of the Jewish community. We have to take that into consideration here. So when we talk about Jesus calling the Pharisees a brood of vipers, the reason for that is, is because they have done nothing but lead the Jewish people away from that relationship with God that God had been pursuing them with all the time, every time they strayed away. I want you to remember that from when we started the message this morning. God was pursuing the people in spite of them straying away, in spite of their rebellion. And he was sending his one and only son to the Jewish people to walk with them and talk with them and give them a living example of God in their midst. That's what was going on here. A revolution. Nothing like this had ever been happened before in the history, period, period. We need to understand that as well. So for the Jewish people, this was a revolution. This was a complete turning upside down of the tables in the temple was just minor stuff. This was a complete change of life and structure of the Jewish community. Complete revolution. We need to understand what this is. From a Cedar Rapids, Iowa perspective, it's hard for us to understand that. But if we go back to that lens and we look at it from the lens of the Jewish community, this was massive, huge, huge. So in the midst of this, you have the chief, the chief priests, the elders, the scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees. They weren't happy about this Jesus. They weren't happy about him coming in and making any waves because they had it pretty good. It'd be like going in and cleaning out the swamp in Washington. You know what I mean? It's what we could take a look at. Well, seriously, it, it draws a similar, a similar parallel. Okay, I shouldn't call it a swamp. Um, so then, in the midst of all that, then, we have King Herod the Great and his reign. And his reign was very uh, stringent upon the people of Jerusalem. He was called Herod the Great because he had did one great thing in his entire life, and that was to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. That's why they called him Herod the Great. So he was well favored by some of the people in there because of the fact that he had restored the temple to the Jewish community. But see, that all came at a cost. And Herod, truthfully, was a ruthless and cruel king, and he was aligned with the Romans which then gave him real power. And no one dared mess with Herod. But see, Herod had this major flaw. All of this power, all of the lavish trappings that he had in his life made him very, very much quite paranoid. And he was likened to have killed you simply for speaking out against him or telling him something he did not like to hear. He was ruthless. He was a killer. He viewed everyone as a threat to the throne, and there was an uprising that happened during his reign by someone who had been banished from the kingdom. They had started an uprise to overthrow Herod the Great. 
Herod believed two of his sons had worked with them to try and remove him through from the throne. So he had him brought before him in the court, and he personally took his knife and slit their throats. His own sons. His own sons. This is how ruthless Herod was. It was a different time and a different culture back then. Now, we've been seeing some of that imagery on Wednesday nights as we looked through these film clips, and it was a brutal, brutal time back there. A lot of death, a lot of killing. It was gruesome to live back in those times. So when you think about the fear that the people had of stepping out of line, you know, they had to worry about the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and getting them people upset with their 630 laws that they had to obey each and every day or be punished. Then you had the Romans who were in and occupying the territory. And if you dare speak out against the Roman, it usually meant death. And usually not a really pleasant death. It wasn't a fast one. It was going to be slow and torturous. And they were, they were great at those kind of things. And then on top of that, you had King Herod, their king, the king of the Jewish people. And if you stepped out of line with Herod, guess what? You're going to end up dead too, no matter if you're family or not. So living in those times there wasn't like living here in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. For us right now, we got it pretty darn good compared to back then. So we have to look and understand this time in the Bible and what was going on when Jesus came into the Bible. Let's look at Matthew 2, 1 through 12. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the day of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, where is he has been born, the king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled. Remember? Paranoid. I like to swap out the word troubled for paranoid. Okay? And all of Jerusalem with him. And then when he had gathered all of the chief priests and the scribes and the people together, he inquired of them where this Christ was going to be born. So they said to him in Bethlehem of Judea, for this is written by the prophet, which we had written before, which we had told you before. That was Micah 5 too. But you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod, when he had secretly called the wise men, determined from them what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search carefully for the young child, and when you have found him, bring back word to me, so that I may come and worship him also. Lie. Then, when they heard the king, they departed, and behold, the star which they had seen in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy, and when they had come into the house and they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, they fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasure, they had presented gifts to him of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. <clears throat> then being divinely warned in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed for their own country another way. So Herod was plotting to kill this would-be ruler that was going to come and take his throne away from him. That's that paranoia I was talking about. So when Herod heard this, being very paranoid, sent his soldiers to find this baby king then and have him killed. Those were the orders that were coming from King Herod. So Jesus at this point in time, and when he started his life off, it was not going to be an easy one. Not at all. So Joseph and Mary were warned to flee to Egypt where they stayed for five years. So even at the beginning of Jesus' life, it was going to be a troublesome time. He was going to have Jewish people that were coming against him from his very birth, King Herod. So Herod's soldiers told him that the child was not to be found in Bethlehem. So Herod ordered the death of all children under the age of two years, which is called the killing of the innocents. Herod soon fell ill and died himself. And his son, Herod Antipas, was then appointed Roman governor to rule over Galilee 
had that region. Soon thereafter, Joseph and Mary returned to their home in Nazareth in Galilee, which is where Jesus then had his formative years and he grew up. And that was most likely because they wanted to remain out of sight from Herod. Now understand, we got several Herods here. Uh, there's quite a few Herods in the Bible, so I want to get this straight so when you're reading this, they don't really differentiate a lot between one Herod to the next to the next. I think it was kind of like, no offense, it's kind of like the Nate Joe, you know, kind of a generic. Herod was kind of the Joe of the day. That's what I figured out. <clears throat> so, there's quite a few Herods in the Bible. We want to figure out who's who. So we have Herod the Great, only great because he rebuilt the temple. Then we have um, who also ordered the murdering of all the innocents and had wanted to see Jesus dead for being named by the wise men to be the ruler of the Jews. Then we have Herod Antipas. Now remember I said Herod had four sons and he killed off three of his sons and so this is the remaining son that's left, Herod Antipas. Um, and so Herod Antipas was the same one who had previously ordered the death of John the Baptist head off on the parade because John had spoke against him taking the wife of his uh, brother and I don't know, I don't know. It was a brutal time back then. So she wanted, she ordered his, John the Baptist head on a plate. So it was delivered to her on a silver platter. So Herod Antipas is the one who ordered the death of John the Baptist. And according to some Pharisees had also plotted to have Jesus killed as well and he was then, at the time of Jesus' crucifixion, he was the one who presided over that. Now there's a lot of other Herods in the history, but none of them really have any consequence in this story. So, so all this has the makings of a great Hollywood movie, or at least a miniseries, right? Get that? Yeah, that's, you're stuck with me. What can I say? You're just stuck with me. So that brings us to Jesus' beginnings in his ministry, as we've seen in the Chosen series so far. And the ministry of Jesus was a start of something revolutionary for the Jewish people. It was a complete departure from what they thought they knew of God. Now remember, they couldn't go to God directly. They had to go through the priests, the chief priests, the scribes, and those people who interceded on their behalf to God. So Jesus coming among them was going to be a complete departure from their entire way of life, what they've been brought up to know to this point in time, and what they knew of God and his will then for the people, because his will had always been interpreted through these others. Well, that maybe get filtered a little bit so that they have their say up on top of that. That's how they got to the 630 different rules from the 10 that God actually gave. So he came to shake things up to disrupt the status quo. Uh, the start of Jesus' ministry was marked by John the Baptist when he baptized them, baptized Jesus in the Jordan River. The clock started then on what we know as Christianity. All right? It wasn't up until this point in time, so that's some 35 years later. The life and times of Jesus then is where we start Christianity. What he taught who he called, what he said, what he did, and who he was, which was possibly the most controversial life in history. So if we were to go now and to somebody off the streets and give them the Cliff's notion, uh, uh, Cliff's Notes version uh, to someone brand new to the life and times of Jesus, what would you say to them? How would you put this into words for them so that they could understand in Cedar Rapids' ease, our culture, our times, what the life and times of Jesus were about, what Christianity was about when it first began? What are you going to tell them about what he taught, who he called, what he said, what he did, who he was? What are you going to tell them? The Apostle John said, now there are so many other things that Jesus did when he was describing what he could write within his uh, epistles that he wrote. He said, now there are also many other things that Jesus did. 
Were every one of them to be written, I suppose the world itself could not contain the books that could be ready. Written. So, ready, set, goes. Here goes. Well, 2,000 years ago, this, my, this would be my Cliff's Notes version, God's Son entered the world, a world of poverty, oppression, injustice, and war. It was a world where hope seemed desperately in short supply. The people were desperate. They were under attack from the people of the temple who were, who were there to actually help them in their relationship with God. They were there and under the subjugation of the Romans and their rules and their threats of death. And then you had the king. The king who was supposed to be their representative, who was supposed to be ingratiating to the people, who was supposed to be there to help the people and provide for the people. But instead, they had a world of poverty, oppression, injustice, and war. It was a war where hope was desperately, desperately in short supply. An essential part of Jesus' mission was, of course, to die for our sins on the cross and through repentance and faith in him, open that way for us to experience eternal life with God in heaven. So we go in now, we're going to jump into Romans 5.8, and it says, that God demonstrated his own love for us in this. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we were yet separated from God through our rebellion, through our sins, Christ died for us. In spite of what we did, in spite of what our past was, in spite of all the things that we did against the will of God and breaking all of his commandments, in spite of all that, Christ died for us. His Romans went too short on it. Because unless we look at it from that perspective, because that's what it's all about, because God's love was so great for us, he was pursuing us in spite of who we are, and what we are, and what we've done, Christ died for us. Jesus paid the penalty for our sins, but there's more. When Jesus began his ministry on earth, standing up in the synagogue at Nazareth to read the scriptures, he outlined what his mandate was from God, and that was to preach the good news to the poor, proclaim freedom for the prisoners, recovery of the sight for the blind, and to release the oppressed, Proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. We find that in Luke 4, 18 to 19. Jesus came to preach the good news. See, the good news, when we use that term, the gospel, the gospel means good news. So when we talk about the gospel of Jesus, that is the good news. So that's what it translates to. To give the people of an understanding of the kingdom of God and the eternal hope that they have through him. Have through him. It's a promise. And Jesus particularly delighted in doing his work amongst the impoverished, the weak, the hurting, and the rejected in the society. Remember prior to Jesus' birth with Mary and Joseph? what they went through before Jesus was born and during, his, during the pregnancy. See, they had to overcome those things. But God brought them through it and saved them so that Jesus could be with us. That was the first act of salvation. Don't let it be lost. That was the first act of salvation. Jesus not only preached the good news through his words, but he powerfully demonstrated the good news through his actions. What he did, what he said, who he taught, who he called. Remember all that? This is what he did because he was God living amongst the people even though some of the people rejected him and turned away from him and turned a blind eye to him. That's where that saying comes from, by the way. They turned a blind eye to who Jesus was. They refused to accept the fact that this is who Jesus was. When he went to his own town of Nazareth, and they watched him as a boy growing up. Well, you can imagine, boys will be boys. 
And so when he went back to tell the people in, in Nazareth, his hometown, the people who knew him the best, they rejected him. They turned a blind eye to who he was because they knew him to be somebody different. They watched him grow up. How can this be our Messiah? They turned a blind eye. But see, he was there for the recovery of the sight for the blind to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. So, if we go back to the very first part of my sermon today, here this morning, you'll see then that throughout the Bible we see God's compassion and concern for those who are in need. We see it over and over and over again. On the Exodus coming out of Egypt, he provided what? He provided manna. He provided quail. He provided water for the people. He provided sustenance for the people in the desert, in the midst of nothingness out there. Most people don't understand that. In the midst of absolute nothingness, God provided daily for his people out of love, out of his compassion for their need. In the Old Testament, he constantly commanded his people to reflect his heart to those around him. And in Isaiah 117, it says, learn to do good, seek justice, Rebuke the oppressor, defend the fatherless, plead for the widow. This is God's word to the people. Don't cast these people aside. Show them the love that your Father has for you, your Father in heaven. And feel the strength of God's command to learn to do right. In Jeremiah 22, 3, it says, to do what is just. To do what is just. So if someone wrongs you, do you want to have retribution upon them and eye for an eye, the old, the old Testament stuff? Absolutely. But when he says, instead of doing that, learn to do right. Learn to do what is just. Forgiveness. Forgiveness. Jesus' ministry was a ministry of forgiveness. God went as far as saying there should be no poor among you. Go to Deuteronomy 15, 4 and 5. There should be no poor among you. That means poor in spirit, not just poor money-wise. There should be no poor among you. No one who is in need. No one who is going without food. This is what God is talking about here. From our Western point of view, from our Cedar Rapids culture, we're saying poor means they don't have any money. They can't go down to the store and buy anything. But what God is saying there is let no one among you, no one in your community, no one in the family of God, be poor. Be poor in spirit. Be poor, not enough food. See, unfortunately, this was a lesson that God's people struggled to learn and to understand. And in Isaiah 58, we see God's frustration with his people because of this. The people struggled with their own will versus God's will. Fortunately, we don't see any of that today whatsoever, right? Oh, tough crowd today. Tough crowd. <laughs> so Jesus came to reconcile then this broken world that existed back then. Jesus is still here today to reconcile a broken world. A broken world. See, he wanted to put back all that he created into a right relationship. All that he created back into a right relationship. Bring a kingdom of righteousness and peace and justice back into that world that he created. We call that harmony. Living in harmony with nature. Living in harmony with one another. That's what God's Ten Commandments is all about. I want you to live a harmonious life. Live together without strife. Live, live together without war. Live together without all this killing. I want you to live in peace. And in the midst of all that, he wanted to have that kingdom of righteousness and of peace and injustice and, and all this that he was doing for us. We put him to death on a cross because of it. But see, 
That's not the end of the story. That actually was part of God's story. Because his death, Jesus' death, was the beginning of life, everlasting life for us, salvation for us to join him at the right-hand side of God. And these were revolutionary thoughts to the people of Israel, to the Jewish community, that Jesus, God came down and Jesus died on that cross, rose from the dead because we have faith in him, because we have belief in him. His grace then is sufficient enough to wash away our sins, to tear that temple veil in two that separated the people from the outside of the temple from the Holy of Holies. There's no separation between the people and God any longer. And all of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the chief priests, the prophets, the temple scribes were all given a pink slip that day. Their jobs were no longer necessary. Because God put that right relationship back. He put that back for all of creation at that time. Regardless of who we are, regardless of what we've done, we cannot earn what God has given us by his grace, by his agape love. We earn eternal life through faith in Christ. Revolutionary thoughts and actions. Breaking out of your comfort stone then to step up and step out. To walk in the way of God. To walk in the way of Christ so that others can see Christ living with us. In us. A representation of God. We are God's representatives. We are to represent Christ in everything that we say and in everything we do. This is something that Jesus started, which will be completed then when he comes back again. And we'll have a new world. We get new bodies. No more pain. No more migraines. I can't wait for that day. Do I hear a trumpet? <laughs> well, in the meantime, we still live in a world where there's enormous need, enormous poverty, injustice, pain, war, strife. As God's people were commanded to show his compassion then to the poor, we're called to be his hands and feet to this hurting world. And this is not optional. It's not optional for us. It is our call from God. It's our duty for God and to Jesus for what he has already done for us. It's already been done. We have to understand and we have to accept his gift to us. That's a gift of reconciliation to bring us in relationship with him. It's one of restoration so that no matter who we are, no matter what we've done, how bad we've been, we are restored to God through Christ Jesus. It's a release. He paid the price. He paid for us to be restored, to be released from that prison of our sins. And it's a renewal. It's a renewal for us to start a new life in Christ, to be a new person, to be a new body, to have that release, all paid forward by Jesus for you and I. Revolutionary thoughts. Revolutionary thoughts. Let us pray. Whew. Gracious Lord, we just praise you and thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity to be gathered together here in your name. To be able to worship you for what you have done for us. To bring us that restoration. To bring us reconciliation, release, renewal. All these things that Jesus did for us freely and openly, with an agape love, no strings attached, all we need to do is have faith, trust, belief in your Son, Jesus. You've given us a place to gather here together when we don't know each and every month if we've got enough money to keep the doors open. But you know what? You always provide. Jehovah Jireh, the God that provides. And that's out of faith and trust and love. Dear Lord, we thank you for our family gathered here together today. For the love that we're able to share with one another. For the blessings that we can bring upon each other. 
we thank you that we have brothers and sisters through you in Christ that we can show love to in grace and mercy. Lord, we ask that you would put it upon our hearts, embolden us, empower us to go forth into this world and bring more brothers and sisters back into reconciliation, restoration, release, and renewal all through your son, Jesus. And all these things we pray in your precious and holy name today. And we thank you greatly for that. As I was walking up here out of the corner of my eye, I caught one of the pamphlets that we have back there. It says, somebody loves you. God loves us so much that he sent his son. <coughs> Recently, I had an opportunity to go and visit with someone, and I had that conversation with them. And, you know, it's one thing to have your heart broken by a relationship gone bad or a loss of job or whatever it is, but to have someone tell you that they are not even interested in having that conversation. But Jesus died for them anyway. On the night that he was betrayed, Jesus took bread and he broke it, saying, This is my body broken for you. Take and eat. In the same way, later in the meal, he took the cup and after filling it, he said, This is the cup of the new covenant, my blood shed for the sins of many. Take and drink. Scripture tells us as often as we do this, we are to do so until Christ's return. We are blessed that we can come together. We are blessed that we can have those conversations, hard as they can be and disappointing as they can be, because we want to see all of our friends, all of our family, all of our acquaintances, even people we don't know, in heaven. That's why Jesus did this. That's why we share in this meal together. So that we can be reminded of the great debt that's been paid on our behalf. The body of Christ broke for you. Take me. The blood of Christ shed for you. Take Lord God, even though those kinds of conversations can be so very difficult, so very disappointing, Father, let us continue to pray that this unopened gift that they have from you will be opened. Continue putting people in their lives that will bring up things, spiritual things, that will talk about your son, that will ignite a fire in their hearts, turning that heart from a stony heart to a heart of flesh. Mm -hmm. Father, thank you that you sent your son, this little baby, born in this little tiny town in a stable, laid in a manger, who would not be the mighty warrior that the Israelites were expecting but still brought about a revolution, a revolution of our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. And tonight, it's time for prayers for the people. So if there's anyone that would like prayer, let me know. And Got lots to pray for this morning. So. Bonnie and Tiki's husband, Chuck, is in the hospital. Oh my gosh, really? Um, he's been in there since a couple days after the funeral or after the celebration of life. Um, oh. 
they think it might be just his heart medication, but mm -hmm. he's very tired and he's got a persistent cough that's been going on for a long time where he's having a hard time breathing, so okay. he's also having a hard time staying awake. All right, Father God, we come to you today to seek you in your sanctuary, to humble ourselves and ask the Holy Spirit to come in and fill this place with your holy presence while we pray for one another. As it states in Matthew 7, 7, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. He who seeks, finds and to him who knocks, the door will be opened. Help us to open our eyes and ears and our hearts and minds to the things above and not to the earthly treasures. Help us to be a people of obedience to your word. So when you, we seek your face, you will be there and answer our prayers. Help us to read your word to do so we will not judge others and be misled down the wrong paths. As in Matthew 7, 13, enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction. Help us to earnestly seek you and find our way to your salvation, Lord. And Father God, I am still asking that you bring the rain down on all the fires raging out of control over all America. We ask that your will be done but also ask for amazing grace and mercy be upon all who live near the flames. Be with them and guide them to safety and help them to look to you for divine help in their situations. Father God, I also ask for help for all those persons in the paths of the hurricane. I pray you bring people to help each other through the trying times. Comfort your people, Lord, as only you can. Father God, I lift up Monica, Matt, and Mary. Please get them the help they need to comfort their hearts and minds. Calm the raging storms they are in. Help Mary through her pain and find her the doctor that she needs to help her body to heal. Through their trials, I pray they find you walking with them each and every day. Help them to know they are loved. Father, I lift up Lynette and her family and her dad, Richard, has fallen uh, several times this morning. And we ask for your guidance for the family. Give the doctors wisdom and discernment as to help how to help him. And let your will be done in their lives, Father God. Guide them as only you can. And Lord, I ask, I pray, lift up Chuck, Bonnie Tickey's husband. I ask for guidance for the doctors. I ask for comfort for him for the loss of his wife. I just pray that you will walk with him, Father God. And Father, we lift up those who are online or here today, or have a family member who is suffering from cancer or a severe illness. We pray for your divine intervention in their lives. We pray for the healing power of your love and mercies new each day. Find them right where they are. Bring their bodies back to health. Help them to know that you are their saving grace. Give them courage to fight through each new day and give them joy in the midst of their pain and suffering to sustain them as you restore hope for their future. Because help and hope are here for all of us who call on the name of the Lord. And may God be praised through it all. We know all things are possible with you, Father God, and we thank you for who you are. I ask that you bring our children and grandchildren and our homeless into a right relationship with you. When they stumble, pick them up and bring them back to you. For you are Yahweh Nisi, the Lord, our banner. We praise and honor your holy name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Tim. I always look forward to your prayer time, by the way. It's always awesome. Well, this brings us to the end of our on-air portion of the service today. We thank you for being here with us online. Um, there is the link in our uh, chat session in there on Facebook. So please click on the link if you don't know the words to the songs, because I did pick some songs that may not be exactly what you're used to. Uh, we played them several times here before, but uh, 
please listen to that and let the Spirit talk to you as you're listening to those songs and give you that uplifting. So pray with me this prayer for reconciliation and forgiveness today. Dear Lord, help us to do our very best every day to affirm one another, to remove the barriers that seem to hinder our relationships, and keep us at a distance from one another. Unite us, Lord, in your grace, your peace, your love, and your mercy together with forgiveness upon our hearts. Please give us your grace to heal our short tempers, our destructive habits, and help let go of the grudges we hold on to so tightly. Inspire us, dear God, to be re-gifters of your grace and your mercy, your blessings of your love. Lord, lead us to be vessels and ambassadors of your forgiveness. Help us to be ambassadors of your healing love, of your wisdom. Loving and gracious God, pour out your spirit upon us so that we will have courage to reach out to those who have ever offended or hurt us. With your inspiration, Heavenly Father, may our efforts to heal wounds that hurt our families, our church, and our world, Lord, let us dissipate those. Let us live a life of reconciliation, of restoration, of renewal and release through love, through your grace, through your mercy, that we might represent that to each and every person that we come in contact each and every day. Father, may our efforts heal the wounds that hurt our families, that hurt our churches, that hurt our world. Lord, lead our hearts to worship you more fully each and every day. Bless us, God, that we might have hearts full of your peace. May we strive in everything that we say and everything that we do to be reconciled to you and to one. Help us always to remember and live by the words that Jesus shared with his disciples when he taught them to pray. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those 